Thank you for standing by. This is the conference operator. Welcome to the third quarter 2023 results conference call for Canadian Utilities Limited. As a reminder, all participants are in listen only mode and the conference is being recorded. After the presentation, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. To join the question queue, you may press star then one on your telephone keypad. Should you need assistance during the conference call, you may signal an operator by pressing star and zero. I would now like to turn the conference over to Mr. Lawrence Gramson, Director, Corporate Finance. Please go ahead, Mr. Gramson. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. We're pleased you could join us for Canadian Utilities third quarter 2023 conference call. With me today is Canadian Utilities Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer, Brian Scrobot as well as ACO Power's Chief Operating Officer, Bob Miles, and ACO Energy Systems Chief Operating Officer, Wayne Stensby. Before we move into our formal agenda, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the numerous traditional territories and homelands on which our global facilities are located. Today, we are speaking to you from our ACO Park head office in Calgary, which is located in the Treaty 7 region. This is the ancestral territory of the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprised of the Siksika, Kainai, and Pakani Nations, the Chutina Nation, and the Stony Nakoda Nations that include the Chiniki, Bears Paw, and Good Stony First Nations. The City of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. We honour and respect the diverse history, languages, ceremonies, and culture of the Indigenous peoples who call these areas home. Brian will begin today with some opening comments on our financial results and recent company developments, including regulatory decisions. Following these prepared remarks, Brian, Bob, and Wayne will take questions from the investment community. Please note that a replay of the conference call, a short supplementary presentation, and a transcript will be available on our website at CanadianUtilities.com and can be found in the Investors section under the heading Events and Presentations. I'd like to remind you all that our remarks today will include forward-looking statements which are subject to important risks and uncertainties. For more information on these risks and uncertainties, please see the reports filed by Canadian Utilities with the Canadian Securities Regulators. And finally, I'd also like to point out that during this presentation, we may refer to certain non-GAAP and other financial measures, such as total of segment measures, adjusted earnings, adjusted earnings per share, and capital investment. These measures do not have a standardized meaning under IFRS, and as a result, they may not be comparable to similar measures presented in other entities. And now I'll turn the call over to Brian for his opening remarks. Thanks, Lawrence, and good morning, everyone. Thank you all very much for joining us today for our third quarter 2023 conference call. Canadian Utilities achieved adjusted earnings of 87 million or 32 cents per share in the third quarter of this year, compared to 120 million in the third quarter of last year. As you know, we concluded a successful second cycle performance-based regulation in our Alberta distribution utilities in 2022. 2023 is a single cost of service rebasing year, and in 2024, we will start the third cycle of performance-based regulation with final rebase rates. Performance-based regulation facilitates affordability, which is important to the long-term sustainability of the business, as the savings and efficiencies generated in the second PBR cycle are returned to customers through the rebasing process. As expected, the impact of our Alberta distribution utilities rebasing resulted in lower year-over-year -year earnings in the third quarter. On its own, this rebasing contributed to a year-over-year -year decline in earnings of approximately $17 million. This is a significant impact to 2023 earnings, but for anyone who has listened to our conference calls throughout last year and this year, this is not an expected trend. It is a direct result of the exceptional performance that we drove throughout our second PBR cycle and the savings and efficiencies that are now being returned to customers. As our utility teams continue to work hard to find new efficiencies and drive down costs, we expect to see the earnings pressure associated with this rebasing begin to soften in the fourth quarter of this year. Looking ahead to 2024 and beyond within our Alberta utility businesses, I want to briefly touch on two key regulatory decisions that received earlier this month. First, the Alberta Utilities Commission, or AUC, 
released the parameters for Alberta's third performance-based regulation cycle, or PBR3 for short, which will be the framework in which our Alberta distribution utilities operate for the period between 2024 and 2028. Included in our MDNA for this quarter is a detailed breakdown of the differences and similarities between PBR3 and our outgoing PBR2 framework. At a high level, while PBR3 does include a tiered earnings sharing mechanism, we continue to believe that this framework would create opportunities for us to deliver strong outperformance and growth throughout the term. And importantly, this framework allows us to make investments needed to drive both efficiencies and long-term stability for our energy distribution systems in the province. Also in October, the AUC delivered its decision on the generic cost of capital, or GCOC for short, and the parameters for 2024 and beyond. As was signaled throughout the year, the Commission has adopted the use of a formula for setting ROE, and this decision also reaffirmed equity thickness at set at 37% for the Alberta utilities. The established formula for ROE utilizes a base rate of 9%, and takes into account two variables to adjust this base rate. First, the changes in 30-year Government of Canada bond yields and changes in utility spreads. The Commission will update the ROE annually and issue the following year's ROE in November of the current year. Now, while the final 2024 ROE will still not be known until November of this year, current market data suggests an ROE in the range of 9 to 9.2 percent, up from the current rate of 8.5%. Now, as we begin to operate under these new frameworks in 2024, we'll continue to apply the ownership principles that we have historically used to drive efficiencies and operation excellence across our businesses, and we expect this to drive continued outperformance and growth for our business. Importantly, the receipt of both these critical regulatory decisions well in advance of the respective operating years further reinforces the strides we've seen in reducing regulatory lag in the province and providing prospectivity. Moving on to our natural gas distribution business in Australia, we continue to see strong growth in key operating metrics such as new connections, tariff rates, and system volumes. The narrative for this business, however, remains focused on Australia's in-country inflation profile, which continues to contribute to a year-over-year earnings pressure. As we alluded to in our second quarter 2023 conference call, it is important to remember that inflation in 2022 built rapidly in the second half of last year, with full-year inflation reaching almost 8% by the year-end 2022. As a result of this building profile in the prior year, our third quarter 2022 earnings were exceptionally strong, creating a comparable that is difficult to compete with in 2023 as inflation levels began to moderate. This trend resulted in us reporting year-over-year decline of $8 million for this business in the quarter. Similar to the messaging we delivered throughout this year, we continue to expect Q4 and full-year earnings for this business to be lower than 2022 as the CPI trend continues to moderate in Australia. For added context, in-country estimates continue to suggest full-year inflation in Australia between 4 to 5 percent, which is consistent with the in-market estimates from last quarter. Now, before I move on to our Aquin power businesses, I want to briefly touch on the capital investments we made in the third quarter. The third quarter saw us invest $331 million in our business, with $307 million of the spending being within our existing utilities. This ongoing utility investment ensures a continued generation of stable earnings and reliable cash flows while also driving sustainable rate-based growth. The remaining capital was primarily uh, related to our ongoing renewable generation initiatives at ACO and Power. Moving on to ACO and Power business, we delivered adjusted earnings of $9 million compared to $12 million for the same period last year. While our newly required and recently completed renewable assets contributed to earnings lower demand in our natural gas storage business, timing of costs and seasonally low wind output pressured earnings. As we continue to drive the numerous development processes already underway to completion, 
and these assets begin to contribute additional earnings, we're confident that the earnings power of these assets will become more pronounced. Now, moving to the development side of the discussion, it's been a busy quarter, and one highlighted by the creation and formalization of a number of key strategic partnerships that are paramount for us advancing growth strategy. In September, we, we announced our partnership with the Chiniki and Good Stony First Nations, which saw them become joint owners of the Deerfoot and Barlow Solar facilities. Nurturing Indigenous partnerships that promote social and economic development has long been a hallmark of our method of operating, and we're proud to announce that this agreement with our new partners. The Deerfoot and Barlow Solar facilities are some of the largest solar installations in an urban setting in Western Canada, and I'm proud to say that our Barlow facility achieved full commercial operations in the second quarter of this year. And we expect our Deerfoot project to achieve the same in the fourth quarter of this year. This month, we also announced a virtual power purchase agreement with Lafarge Canada, which will see them receive 100% of the energy produced at our Empress Solar Facility. Again, we are proud to be at the forefront of the energy transition and providing solutions to help customers like Lafarge reduce their own carbon emissions, and it remains a key priority for us in our growth strategy. Agreements like this also align with our target of having approximately 75% of the renewable generation portfolio contracted under long-term agreements with high-quality counterparties. This portfolio view to contractedness helps ensure a stable and secure cash flow stream for the long term, while ensuring that we retain the needed flexibility to maximize value within the portfolio and to capture near-term economic benefits as they arise. For our Empress project, we expect to see uh, achieve full commercial operations in the fourth quarter of this year. Now, looking ahead to our development pipeline, I think it's also valuable to briefly touch on the AUC's decision to pause approvals for the newly re uh, so the new renewable electricity generation projects until February of next year. First and foremost, this announcement does not impact our projects under construction which are the upgrading of the 40-mile wind asset or the near-term development of our 40-mile solar project. For our renewables development pipeline more broadly, we continue to progress our near-term projects and our development pipe timelines did not contemplate a need to file any new AUC applications in advance of the expected lifting of this um, moratorium in February next year. We also continue to be focused on developing the 40-mile solar project and we do not expect the project delays related to this government pause. I would say that throughout this process, we've been working collaboratively with the AUC to ensure that the importance of developing these assets for the benefit of our province and its decarbonization goals is well understood. Finally, we remain committed to our uh, hydrogen project within Alberta's industrial heartland and continue to move development of that project forward. Since last quarter, we've actively re-engaged discussions with both financial and strategic partners, along with the off-takers that are key to underwriting the business case on a project of this scale. We continue to believe that demand of this area exceeds the facility capacity. These negotiations are in advanced stages, and we expect to be able to provide further clarity on timing and next steps in the coming months. Now, on the topic of hydrogen, earlier this week, it was also announced that our ACO Australia Business was named a preferred partner in the delivery of the South Australian government's hydrogen jobs plan. Under this plan, we'll work as part of a consortium with our partner to deliver a strategy and development program for a 250 megawatt hydrogen production facility, along with a 200 megawatt hydrogen fueled electricity generation facility and related hydrogen storage. While this project is in its early days, Projects like this further cement our global hydrogen strategy and our position as leaders in the global transition to a cleaner energy. So summing up overall, our third quarter results were in line with our expectations for a rebasing year. The earnings pressures that we expected related to rebasing and Australia inflation were evident in the quarter, but we expected this rebasing pressure to begin uh, to ease in the fourth quarter. Now, looking again ahead to 2024, 
Our Alberta utilities now have prospectivity following the regulatory decisions on PBR3 and the GCOC that was uh, received earlier this month. As I said in the past, no matter what the regulatory environment we operate in, we remain focused on driving exceptional results for all shareholders and position our businesses to maximize sustainable growth and earnings. I look forward to sharing our full 2023 performance and providing further updates on the progress of our numerous growth initiatives on our next call in early 2024. Now that concludes my prepared remarks, but before we open the call to questions from the analyst community, I just wanna give everyone a chance to hear from both Bob Miles on our Aqua Empower business and Wayne Stensby on our Aqua Energy Systems business. Bob, the Aqua Empower business has made numerous strides in 2023 towards the achievement of its renewable generation and clean fuels growth objectives. In light of this progress, could you comment on the growth you're seeing in the business and where you expect things to go from in the near term? Thanks, Brian. It's hard to talk about where we're going without looking at what we've done in 2023. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm proud to say that we have fully integrated the acquisition that we acquired earlier this year for the the Suncor Renewables acquisition. Uh, we we have fully integrated our two wind assets that are operating. So that, that's a great accomplishment. And, you know, we've also completed the pretty well completed all of the construction on our three solar projects here in Alberta, as you indicated a little earlier. So I think that was a great accomplishment as well. The next project that we're, we're pursuing right now is our 40 mile solar project. You touched on that and, you know, that's a 220 megawatt solar project also in Alberta. And so that's fairly far along. We hope to make FID on that later this year or early into 2024. On the clean fuel side, you did indicate that we're progressing quite nicely on our hydrogen project, both domestically and with regards to export. So um, definitely a busy time right now. So lots on the go. Thanks, Bob. A lot of great opportunities on the horizon, as you said, and exciting to see these initiatives convert to stronger earnings contributions. Wayne, in a similar vein, the third quarter saw your Aqua Energy System business receive two key regulatory decisions, the generic cost of capital and the formalization of the framework for the third year PBR cycle. Now that you're back in Canada and uh, refocused on our Canadian-based businesses for the utilities, can you comment on how you're thinking of Aqua Energy Systems businesses moving forward and what can we expect in the coming years? Thanks, Brian. And, uh, you know, let me start by just saying uh, I'm very excited to be back and leading the utilities portfolio. Luma is in a good place or a good position with Juan Saka stepping into the CEO role. And I'm uh, very confident that the more than 3,500 hardworking women and men who are in Puerto Rico uh, in Luma will continue to build on the substantial early progress that we were all able to make. So, as you say, maybe a little closer to home here in Alberta. Uh, And as you mentioned, a number of regulatory decisions have now been received. And I look forward to working with our teams to build on what really is um, phenomenal progress that the utilities have made through the first two PBR cycles or periods in the distribution businesses and also the strong progress in the transmission businesses. These past periods have have yielded great efficiencies for our customers And I see them as providing a very strong foundation as we now move to um, invest and and perhaps get a little more oriented on growth to serve our customers growing and evolving needs in the province. Thanks, Gwen. That's great insight. Thank you. Uh, We'll now turn the call back to Lawrence to bring us to the formal Q&A component of the call. Thank you, Brian. In the interest of time, we ask you to limit yourself to two questions. If you have additional questions, you're welcome to rejoin the queue. I will now turn it over to the conference coordinator for questions. Thank you. We will now begin the question and answer session. To join the question queue, you may press a star, then one on your telephone keypad. You will hear a tone acknowledging your request. If you are using a speakerphone, please pick up your handset before pressing any keys. To withdraw from the question queue, please press a star, then two. The first question comes from Linda Azergalis with TD Securities. Please go ahead. Um, thank you. 
Um, very interested to hear uh, your updated thoughts on what sort of optimization and cost efficiencies uh, you're working on so that um, your utilities, your distribution utilities can meet or beat uh, any sort of productivity factors that they're, they're working towards. And I guess the second part of that question is we are, you know, still seeing some inflationary pressures in various um, cost buckets. And I'm just wondering, um, in your view, how well uh, the inflation uh, in indices reflect uh, your true underlying inflation or might there be some mismatches for better or worse uh, um, on that front? Thanks, Linda. Appreciate your question. Yeah, in terms of in terms of uh, open performances, I've indicated on on previous calls, and, and we have a long track record of of finding new and creative ways to drive down our costs for for our customers. And you know, we continue to see that throughout this year. Although we've had the expected rebasing, I would say that the teams have have done a great job uh, in the first part of 2023 to, to find some additional savings. Um, uh, throughout our business, and that's and that's throughout. Um, whether it's through some tax efficiencies, uh, whether it's through our operations, of course, the wildfire also uh, diverted some of our from our our teams onto that response effort. So, overall, I guess I would kind of give guidance that we are confident that we can drive uh, that continued efficiencies, as we mentioned. Maybe it's in the one to two hundred basis points range for this year. Obviously, we'll have another resetting in PBR3 and we get into 2024. But for this year, um, the teams are doing extremely well. Uh, in terms of inflationary pressures, like I, I would say in the past, um, you know, we've, we've done really well to kind of work with our vendors and suppliers to maintain our expected cost increases in line with kind of general inflation and sometimes improve. Uh, we've had a little bit of delay over a period of time on some of our materials, um, especially some of our long leads. And we've just changed our practices to going forward to make sure that we get well well ahead of ordering long-term expected uh, supplies for some of our projects. And we did that on our solar facilities, getting ahead and ordering all the panels. So Bob, as you mentioned, can hit those timelines. So overall, I think um, we're not expecting any inflationary pressures that are outside of what we're seeing, um, I guess, generally in the, in, in the market. Thank you. Um, and maybe just uh, moving to Australia, just trying to understand kind of what the um, financial benefit might be uh, on this hydrogen project beyond just leveraging the learnings for future projects. Um, is there some sort of... Um, um, revenue model here, or is it driving business through your existing assets? Can you comment on kind of what the what the end game is and the magnitude of any sort of um, economic participation? Given that my understanding is the Australian government will will own the facilities. Yeah, maybe I'll start and then I'll I'll ask Bob to help chip in here. And and so first of all, I, I would just kind of comment that it's it's very early days, and and yeah, we're very excited um, to work with the South Australian government. On, on this project and and um, it really sees kind of the the benefit of kind of our outward um, approach to the hydrogen strategy globally and, and how we're recognized um, in the jurisdictions that we operate in and, and um, again it's, it's too early to talk about the funding model um, and how big this project will be I think that's part of this project it's part of what we've been engaged to do is to, to, to provide that preliminary review but I do think it's it's great for our business and um, kind of builds on some of the work that we've been doing across our various business units. And maybe Bob, I'll turn it over to you to kind of maybe provide some further color. Yeah, maybe the only other things. Uh, by the way, hi Linda. The only thing I'd add to what Brian said is is this project. I could say I, I would say could be one of three things. It could be um, engineering, procurement, construction. It could be engineering, procurement, construction, and operation. And there's the potential of equity ownership as well. So as Brian indicated, it is early days, but the, all of three of those scenarios have all been discussed with the South Australia government as well. Thank you. I appreciate the context. The next question comes from Rob Hope with Scotiabank. 
please go ahead. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, wanted to circle back on the uh, on the in power business. Uh, you know, it's been a little choppy out there in terms of valuations, the pause. And on the Q2 call, you had talked about the potential for looking at other financing opportunities for this business, whether it be uh, you know a number of outcomes there. So just wonder if you could give us a, an update on how you're thinking about in, uh, financing the uh, renewable power business. Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll I'll start off and um, on the financing side. Yeah, like as as we talked about in the second quarter, you know we're we're looking at um, you know the long term, um, well, how we're going to fund the business, and we must consider how we best optimize the value for CWL shareholders and each step of the way. Well, in the immediate term, our funding needs are tied to the continued development of our renewables pipelines and the pre FID hydrogen work. So to support this need, we're continuing to consider partnerships uh, options, particularly in the short term. Longer term, though, we'll continue to evaluate both private and public sources of funding for the continued growth of the company. So, you know, with all the strategic decisions that we make, we'll continue to evaluate these opportunities through the lens of shareholder value creation and the long-term growth and stability of this business. Um, any further comments, Bob, you want to make? Rob, the, the other thing is on our on the larger projects in NPower, specifically the large hydrogen projects, it's it's not just a matter of the financing. We're also looking at who we partner with strategically with regards to strong operating partners, strong offtake partners. And and with that, they also bring the financing side as well. So that's all very much part of the strategy as we we build out Atco and Power. I appreciate that. And then maybe more broadly, uh, with the strong balance sheet, uh, you were able to access capital uh, a little over a month ago at attractive rates, um, as well as kind of the choppiness we're seeing in the market. You know, have you thought or kind of what are your views on acquiring assets a little counter cyclical? cyclically uh, in this environment and using your balance sheet to maybe buy things for values. Yeah, thanks, Rob. And yeah, I would say that we're constantly um, evaluating opportunities, um, whether it's through MRA or, or other, other parts of business. And, um, you know, that doesn't change. Yes, there's some volatility in the cycle right now and and appreciate that where the capital markets are today. Um, but yeah, like I, I'd say that we're constantly evaluating uh, in all of our aspects of our business and, and geographic locations, opportunities. And if there is something out there that is attractive and creative, uh, we'll certainly look at it. Thank you. The next question comes from Maurice Choi with RBC Capital Markets. Please go ahead. Maurice, your line is open. Sorry about that. Um, Meet it myself. Good morning, everyone. Um, just wanted to follow up on the ATCO Empower. Uh, sorry if I missed this, but when are we expecting to provide? Uh, when, are, when, when are we expecting to hear um, a meaningful update on this, um, if not a decision? And also, I know that you've been doing some market feedback on the potential options on this. So, any thoughts on? on what you've been hearing, uh, recognizing obviously as, as um, my colleague mentioned, the market is choppy. Sorry, Maurice, just to clarify, update on on some of our projects or update on um, Empower, kind of sorry. Em how we look to fund Empower. this? Well, Empower's potential separation specifically. Um, I, uh, I recognize I see. Okay. how you respond to the previous question, but uh, you know, timing-wise, when can we have clarity on it? Yeah, like, you know, in terms of t timing, um, again, we're not rushing into anything. We said that we would evaluate as we kind of went through the, the previous question, you know, as we look to build out and some of these bigger projects come online, you know, we'd be evaluating all options. Where the capital markets are today, as Bob kind of alluded to, certainly partnerships is kind of a, a key, probably near-term solution and, 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 and focus. But over the long term, as as, as a previous comment on the quarter, we're going to look at all opportunities in alternatives, including the public and private markets. And just to be clear, as Bob mentioned, partnerships on the hydrogen project specifically, when it comes to the entire ATCO and power entity, 
um, are you suggesting that there's also a partnership for the entity or more like on a project by project basis? It's more of a project by project basis, um, Maurice. And again, like we're going to evaluate all of those as those come up. And you've seen us um, just announce a partnership on some of our renewables. And and uh, so that's kind of evidence of what we're, we're looking at. So is it fair to say that at Compower, at least from a base case, will remain within at um, CU um, and with the C partnerships from this point onwards? Yeah, like, again, listen, um, we will evaluate all opportunities. But for now, yes, we were considering the partnerships. And as we grow up the business, um, I'm not going to suggest that all any options are not on the table. But certainly we see partnerships within CU as being um, you know, a, a meaningful way to fund the near-term projects of this nature. Great, that makes sense. Um, maybe I just want to finish off on the government's review of the electricity pricing market, including reducing T&D costs. I know in the last call you mentioned that you, you weren't expecting anything negative from this review, um, but obviously cost of capital is higher, notwithstanding that your RE now looks to, to rise next year. So as you look at the cost structure for a TND uh, for customer bills, where would you see costs coming down for the government to achieve this TND cost reduction? Yeah, like like I, it's a great question, and and um, I think as I alluded to in prior calls, you know what we can directly do in our business is what we try to focus on, and and certainly we as we've kind of communicated, we've worked really hard to drive down our costs for our customers. And you've seen a rate reduction, both in our transmission business and our distribution business with the PBR rebasing. So that is the meaningful thing that we can do as a, as a utility company. That said, we continue to work with the ISO and you know, in terms of project designs and, and market studies to help how we best source and do the right price signals to get the most efficient way of connecting new generation. But also, how do we um, ensure that our distribution and transmission grids can provide, continue to provide the safe and reliability of the energy delivery? Um, I know, Wayne, anything else that you'd want to offer? You know, maybe what I would um, kind of just add, Brian, is we we completely recognize the challenges of affordability, you know, here in Alberta and across Canada, right? And um, so, so we're well aware of that. We uh, we empathize with our customers as they have seen cost increases. The cost on the bill is, of course, uh, the sum of the transmission and and distribution or the delivery costs and the generation costs. And um, you know, as as you would recognize, there's been some volatility in all of that in the last few months and even years. Uh, as Brian indicated, as we move forward, I think. Our emphasis is going to be on how do we continue to invest in those networks and bring uh, the reliability improvements and the res climate adaptation and resiliency improvements that our customers are really demanding. So I see it as far more than just a cost conversation. Um, and, and I think that's very important in our role as we uh, have these these distribution and transmission utilities here in Alberta and our role as a as a broader energy provider. Great. Thanks for the color. The next question comes from Mark Jarvie with CIBC Capital Markets. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Good morning, everyone. So just coming to the decisions, the formula for the ROE and, and the PBR parameters, including an earned training mechanism, how, how would you think that all shakes out? You know, obviously the base ROE is going higher, but you then move into an earning sharing mechanism on above 200 basis points. Do you think the all-in er, all earned ROE changes at all under the new construct relative to what you were operating under previously? Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, yeah, great question. And, you know, overall, I think we're, we're um, you know, in terms of generic cost of capital decision, um, as a kind of expected, the commission moved to a formula uh, with the goal of reducing regulatory lag. Um, that said, you know, I, I, we're, we're, we're thankful that the, the base ROE has gone up. That said, it's, it's probably below what we'd like it to be, but it's, it's 
it's still going in the right direction. Um, you know, in terms of the earnings sharing mechanism, at least, you know, the first 200 basis points uh, is, is on the count of shareholders. And that, above that, there starts to becoming a sharing, which, you know, as I, I think is a, is a balance that the commission struck uh, at the end of the day, providing a, a supportive net, um, framework. Um, I'm sorry, I'm kind of mixing that with the PBR, but because um, I do think they're both tied in terms of the um, ability to share um, and having a proper ROE. So I, I do think that it's kind of in line with what we would have expected. And uh, I think as a supportive framework, I think on the PBR side, in terms of having the, the formula way approved it is, having some um, capital tracker mechanisms allow us to um, pursue decarb um, opportunities is, is supportive. And they even put in some creative um, mechanism on a pilot project to say if we could, because if we have a capital versus an O&M uh, decision to make to the extent that we could prove that it's a uh, benefit of customers to have an O&M solution that we're allowed to earn on that program. So I think the commission has taken a positive step forward in, in this in this um, in this decisions. And um, yeah, I think we're now that we have the rules uh, unknown, and again, I'll go back to our previous tried and true uh, um, ability to find ways to generate value for our shareholders throughout any PPR or, or cost of or generic cost of capital framework. And just to follow up on the comments made earlier about the annual updates, you've gotten the clarity that the, under even under the distribution utilities operate under PBR that there'll be an annual ROE update because I know in some jurisdictions they set it at the the beginning of the of the five year window and then you kind of operate under that base ROE. And I guess if you do have an annual updates, does that make it harder to manage through PBR in terms of how you think about timing and working through cost savings through the five year period? No, like in terms of the annual update for the um, the generic cost of capital rate flowing through, is that referring to Mark? Yep. yep, yep. Yeah, no. Yeah, and no, that's not, uh, you know, that's it doesn't change things. It's in terms of our formula, normal compensation for inflation, and that is a, a typical thing through a, a PBR framework. But the update to ROEs, um, instead of being flat, yeah, they will change maybe up or maybe down depending on kind of online parameters those two but i don't think it's going to materially change throughout the five-year period and and um, it'll be set november each year and like i said in the on my opening remarks we expect that to be north of nine percent for the for 2024. okay and then just one last question for me is just as you look into the medium term particularly your Alberta utilities, are you seeing anything changing in terms of the outlook, demand, regional needs, technology changes, anything sort of factoring into what you think the rate base outlook looks like for any of the utilities in Alberta, maybe on a three to five year outlook? Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll let Wayne kind of answer this one. I think he kind of hit it off in terms of, in terms of what our outlook looks like. And um, certainly all of those factors are something that are currently on our, on our rider. Maybe Wayne, do you want to, Get your views on that. Yeah, and I think you hit the the kind of key elements in a way, but um, you know, and I'm almost building on the affordability conversation from from a couple of questions ago. But we are seeing uh, strong demand growth from our customers across the province. Alberta, um, the Alberta economy is doing well, um, and you know, in an inflationary situation, right? So uh, we are seeing customer growth. We are seeing, um, I would say, ever-increasing needs from our customers or, or wants from our customers from their utilities. And, uh, and so we are <clears throat> building strong plans as we move forward to invest and support um, that those growing customer needs and growing numbers of customers. So um, we are we we see the next three to five years as um, as very positive for our four Alberta utilities. And was that expected to manifest itself into higher rate base growth when you look at maybe in a five year horizon? Yes. Okay, I'll leave it there. Thanks. The next question comes from Patrick Kenny with National Bank Financial. Please go ahead. Thank you. Good morning. Um, you guys touched on the uh, on Luma in your prepared remarks, but 
any update or guidance on when we might see a transition from the, uh, the supplemental to the O&M agreement? I'll pass that one on to Wayne. It, uh, good morning, Patrick. Yes, it is the, um, it is the question we've been, um, we've been facing, I suppose, for two or, you know, two or three years at this point in time. Um, but maybe I can offer you a little more kind of color there. The, it, it's in the public, um, markets that the court, um, dates or the confirmation hearing dates have been set for the first two weeks of March of next year. Um, I, you know, it's possible those are delayed, but I think it's highly unlikely at this point in time. It's a U.S. federal bankruptcy um, court, and so the judge will hold those confirmation hearings. If you follow then kind of, you know, conventional thinking from March, um, I think that that plan will take, um, you know, there'll, there'll have to be the hearing or the trial, I guess, then the evidence, then the eventual ruling. Um, that will probably take you all the way till middle of next year. And then there's the implementation of the plan. So, and on broad strokes, we would imagine that, that PREPA emerges from bankruptcy perhaps um, towards the end of, of 2024. That said, uh, as you know, Luma extended the supplemental period with no deadline uh, roughly a year ago. And so if it takes longer, it takes longer. I think our real focus, um, you know, organizationally is to continue to build on what we were hired to do, which is fundamentally transform the electric system in Puerto Rico um, and and rebuild and, and improve that system. And so that's where I would tell you the vast majority of, of the focus is as we follow through the bankruptcy. I, I guess I should have added, of course, as, as you know, once we... Uh, move out of the supplemental period, we move into the 15-year term of the contract. Right. Okay. That's perfect. Thank you for the update. Um, and then maybe just shifting gears to the balance sheet, um, Brian, you issued some 30-year paper late in the quarter. Can you just provide maybe an update on your funding needs for the remainder of the year and maybe into 2024? Um, are there any other upcoming maturities or CapEx spend that you might be able to pre-fund and maybe take some additional market risk off the table? Yeah, thanks, Patrick, for your question. Yeah, you mentioned our our, um, our issue that we did earlier in the year and, and um, you know, very, very successful, very happy with the outcome of that, that debt issue, um, got very favorable rates and well oversubscribed. Um, and it's also the kind of the first issue since um, withdrawing from our ratings from S&P. And um, so in terms of the rest of the year, no, we don't expect to have to access the market uh, for the remaining of this year. Um, and then to, the, to next year, I'd see that, you know, we have some definitely some flexibility there. And um, at least on the, the CU Inc. side, we expect to be probably around the same range of, of this year for our, our needs, but with some flexibility. Got it. Thanks for that. I'll leave it there, guys. Once again, anyone on the conference call who wishes to ask a question may press star one at this time. The next question comes from Ben Pham with BMO. Please go ahead. Hi, good morning. I wanted to go back to the Alberta rebasing. I know you you mentioned that it's tracking in line with your expectations, the, the rebase and where earnings are going uh, for 2023. I, I wanted to uh, reconcile that with some of your comments early in the year. I think you mentioned Q3 was going to be a, a peak rebase and then you would see growth in Q4. Is, is that still the, the trend? Because it looks like Q3 ended up not being as bad as Q2. Yeah, no, no, thanks, Ben. Comments. And I'd say generality in terms of the seasonality of that's typically the case. And I would say there's all that said, there's always some timing of costs and initiatives uh, that happen throughout the year. And, and I would say for the third quarter here, 
we did have some time, especially in our electric uh, distribution business, um, timing of some costs, which probably improved us versus where kind of above the normal seasonality uh, would be. So I guess, yes, overall, um, we would expect, but with that kind of a proviso that we do have on a typical year, some timing of operating issues from one year to the next. And whether it's us working on wildfire restoration, that changes some of our time of our own M costs. Um, those are kind of like examples which could, you know, from a, a typical year over year comparison and cause some some noise. Yeah, is that, that Q3 uh, timing and some of that maintenance work, is that pushing to, to Q4 then that uh, maybe you won't see growth year over year? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I, I say we're still back in line with what we expect for when we communicated. Listen, we know we're coming off um, a 2022 outperformance, and I uh, you think you've seen the regulatory filings and the, the significant outperformance we, we achieved. We do expect to come back down to kind of that one to 200 basis point range uh, by the end of the year. So I do see a little bit of that averse in Q4, but, but again, I, I do think it's – in line with the guidance that we've already provided into that, you know, one to 200 basis point range. I understood. And, and I know usually with the second question is on, on CapEx. I mean, no news means there's no uh, change in that utility CapEx budget. Uh, but I wanted to check those some reference to maybe rate base uh, growth, maybe moving better than expected. Is that more reference to, to your beyond your guidance timeframe? Yeah, like, that's a great question, Ben. I think I think Wayne kind of alluded to in kind of his his comments. Like we do see um, some significant growth in our jurisdictions here, and and certainly, uh, you know, being mindful of the affordability of our customers. But we are seeing pressures um, from the growth and evolving demands from our customers, um, and also we recognize there's a little bit of a pause on the renewables, but. Reality is we do need to connect and make sure that we continue to provide a network which has safe and reliable energy and serving our needs. So, you know, I think this is evolving. Um, you know, we expect to give an update. Um, you know, typically we provide a, a further update at the end of in the year. So in February, we'll provide kind of a, a more refined guidance in, in terms of what our expectations and outlook is for the next, say, three to five years. Okay, that's great. Thank you. This concludes the question and answer session. I would like to turn the conference back over to Mr. Lawrence Granson for any closing remarks. Thank you, operator, and thank you all for participating today. We appreciate your interest in Canadian utilities, and we look forward to speaking with you again soon. This concludes today's conference call. You may disconnect your lines. Thank you for participating, and have a pleasant day.